Oh, I see. There we go. All right. So today we have Markus Sperling tell us about magnetic quivers and negatively charged brains. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the meeting. And uh, thank you very much for showing up a little bit earlier um, than, than the usual time. Um, so today I want to use um, the, the seminar to speak about a, a recent project that I uh, finished with Amihai. Um, actually, it's it's not that recent. We we started that uh, sort of uh, four years ago, and then in between it it uh, went into a pause, and then we resumed uh, uh, rather recently. And now now we are ready to uh, talk about the results in more detail. And before I go into all of the the global details, I want to briefly review and motivate what we're doing in case um, that there are some people that uh, don't do magnetic groups uh, every day. So uh, let, let's start. With what's the motivation? So the motivation is that we look at uh, modular spaces of supersymmetric theories with eight supercharges. And in particular, we look at the ones that have uh, hypercalar geometry, which is uh, sort of the more supersymmetry, the more rigid uh, the geometry becomes, and hypercalar is one of these very rigid ones. And one of these prototypical examples of uh, a hypercalar modular space is uh, as a Higgs bunch of uh, theory with eight supercharges. And uh, it is sort of very well known that if you have a Lagrangian theory, then these uh, modular space is essentially given by uh, uh, computing all the gauge invariant uh, scalar operators that you can that you can have that live in a hypermultiplet, and then you uh, look at the geometric space. And this turns out to be a very nicely uh, geometric object, a hypercalar quotient. And we, we simply need classical physics because it's protected from, from quantum corrections. And that is sort of the, the, the very beautiful story for these Lagrangian theories. But then later it turns out with all the, the advances of uh, super semantic theories in various dimensions, that Higgs boundaries are not necessarily classically exact, but there's uh, a plethora of examples where there are extra degrees of freedom that can enter the Higgs point spectrum at some point. And then they can completely change the geometry, well, not completely change the geometry, but they can completely uh, overwhelm your classical description and give you a completely new object. And for this, we have plenty of examples. We have in, in six dimensions, which is the focus of today, uh, these tensional strings, which can enter the, the Higgs bunch spectrum at a very singular point of the tensor branch. But we also know in five dimensions, for instance, uh, we know various people have studied the, the symmetry enhancement if you go to the um, conformal fixed points, but actually it's not only the symmetry enhancement, you can study, you can actually study the, the entire uh, Higgs bunch enhancement. And likewise, we have in four dimensions special points, uh, for instance, the just circus points where the Higgs bunch is a non classic object. And then we do have a question how do we describe these spaces? And that is precisely where this uh, object that we want to talk about in, in whole length comes into play. It is the, the magnetic quiver. And um, the magnetic quiver actually builds up on uh, a different modular space, which is also hypercalar. So uh, besides the Higgs branch, we also have coulomb branches. So the one parameterized by the um, scalar by the vacuum expedition values of the scalar fields in the vector multiplet. And th these are sort of more special in the sense only the, the 3D n equals 4 uh, coulomb branches are hypercalar, hypercalar space. But it's also very, very different from the Higgs branch in the sense it is not classically exact. So there's a bunch of quantum questions that we need to take into account. And we cannot just form uh, gauge invariant uh, combinations of microscopic fields that we have in some UV description, but actually we need to use something that's called monopole operators. And once you appreciate that you can that you can use these um, operators, you can propose a quantum corrective description of these Coulomb branches. And then you can, you can quantify the space by various types of information. Of course, you can start with numbers like dimensions and uh, logosymmetries, but then you can also go ahead and uh, compute more complicated and more informative quantities, such as uh, a Hilbert series, which would give you uh, a generating function for the uh, spectrum, or you can compute a phase diagram. Or if you're, if you're super strong, you can even go ahead and compute the entire chiral ring, but that, that is uh, usually very difficult for generic space. right? And most of the... Um, Techniques that we're using, they, they build up on uh, what's called the coulomb branch Hilbert series, a monopole formula. And uh, I guess in this audience, I don't have to emphasize that this has led to quite some work in physics as well as in uh, mathematics. So what's now the point of the magnetic quiver? Just to uh, set the stage. So what we want to propose is uh, the idea that we have these um, Higgs branches and various dimensions with eight supercharges, which can be beyond the hypercalar quotient. And so we want to describe them somehow geometrically. And we propose that you can do this by deriving an auxiliary object, which we call the magnetic quiver. And then the, the whole purpose in life of a magnetic quiver is that the 3D and four coulomb branch of this auxiliary object, this gives you a geometric description of the Higgs branch you want to study. 
right? So, so that's sort of the, the whole purpose. And then you might say, okay, that sounds 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 very nice. How do we how do we actually do this? And here, um, the the starting point is actually that we use brain systems and type two, similar to the or essentially the generalizations to the Hanani written setups um, from ninety six. And uh, today, I'm going to specifically focus on sixty one comma zero theories uh, for the theories that are derived from M five brains on A and D type singularity. So, what is the uh, status of these uh, sixty theories? Well, in the, um, most of the cases that we know so far, we derive them from brain configurations, such that the 60 theories that we were looking at, or the, the low energy effective description, they are composed of classical gauge groups, so SU, SP, SO type uh, groups, and then they're connected by some fundamental by fundamental metafields. Um, and that, that is sort of standard uh, brain configurations. And if you like, in terms of F theory, you can think about it as uh, SUN gauge groups on a minus two curve, or SP on a minus one, or SO uh, gauge groups on a minus four curve. But then of course we know there's a bunch of, uh, or there's various works on 60 theories going on. We know that the, the, the theories that we have been looking at is not the end of the line. We know there's a, a lot more theories out there. So we can ask the question, how can we approach these different uh, theories which have uh, different gauge groups, which have different math problems? And as we will see later, one way of approaching them by still using brain systems is that we can sort of change the boundary conditions of the six brain ending on the eight brains. And once we, we allow for that, we can actually uh, approach theories where we have a different, where we have different matter contents. For instance, we can have a, by a vice spin and matter content, or we can have exceptional gauge groups. Or if you, if you like, in terms of F theory, now we're gonna approach, for instance, um, the, the gauge groups on the minus three curve, right? So that's sort of the, the outline for today. So we're gonna make the transition from the, the standard brain con uh, construction to brain constructions which give us this funny matter content. In order to realize this, we're gonna need um, these negatively charged brains, which are already in the title of the talk. But before we go there, I still have to tell you uh, some some uh, some details. And once we once we're ready for the for the more interesting parts, then we can talk about uh, some very well. I would say very interesting model spaces, which turn out to be related to new problems. Any uh, questions so far? Very good. Right. Then let's get into some uh, preliminaries. So what, um, what the class of theories um, we're gonna look at today is M5 points on AOD type singularities. If you start with the A-type case, then we know the um, A-type singularity is a four dimensional object. So we align it in uh, direction seven, eight, nine, and 10. And we know that the, the singularity at the origin then becomes essentially a line if I plot the, this direction as the X6 direction. So this line is just the, the singular um, point at the ALE space. And then we add M5 brains, which are extended between zero and uh, five. And then um, the, the point that we want to make is that there are various phases of this theory parameterized by the way we can arrange these M M5 brains. Right? So the M5 brains, they can either be on the singularity, they can be away from the singularity, they can be on top of each other, or they can be well separated. All of these give you different phases of, uh, of the system and we want to study the corresponding Higgs branches. How, how do we do this? Is we're going to go to the dual type three pick two, in which the A type singularity dualizes to a stack of k d six brains, and the M five brains become minus five brains. Now here you see that on the left and the right, uh, in principle, we have uh, a stack of d six brains which is extended to plus minus infinity. So it's a semi infinite stack which usually gives you uh, flavor nodes. Then um, you you can change the setup a little bit. Well, actually, not, not changing, but you can introduce uh, the eight brains. So you can um, end the D6 brains on the, the far left and on the far right by uh, putting in the eight brains from infinity. And when we do this, we, we don't want to change the we don't want to change the theory. That means all of the D6 brains, which I have, for instance, on the left hand side, they still are supposed to end on the N5 brain here. That means I need to uh, pull in as many D8 brains as I have D6 brains, right? And that basically means that I gonna be dealing with trivial boundary conditions if I if I just change the setup to including the DA brains. And here, of course, when, when I tell you I can introduce trivial boundary conditions, then you will probably quite, uh, um, quite you will be guessing that we can also introduce non non trivial boundary conditions, which basically means that I can lift off some of these these six segments between the DA brains, and then uh, I'm gonna have a, a system. We're going to have to suspend my KD six brains on 
uh, generically L, which can be less than or equal to uh, K of the eight points. So I have uh, partitions of K, which parameterize me my boundary conditions. And then you would need to figure out what is the um, low energy effective description. And I just want to summarize this briefly in this um, in this example. So here we're going to take a sufficient amount of M5 brains on a Z9 singularity. And I'm going to take on the right hand side um, boundary conditions trivial on the right on the left hand side non-trivial. So what how do we do this now? The, the way we do this is we take the, the Z9, um, which gives us the, 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 the six brains. Then we have the M5 brains, and I'm just going to arrange them on the line. And then the right boundary conditions tells you trivial, meaning we have nine D8 brains in the first interval from the right hand side. Similarly, on the left hand side, we're going to have one D8 brain in the fourth interval from the left hand side. We're going to have two um, D8 brains in the second interval from the left hand side, and one D8 brain in the first interval from the left hand side. So now we have placed the D8 brains. Now we need to figure out how many D6 brains are there. If we are in the interior of that whole setup, so far away from the from the D8 brains, then we know we have a Z9 uh, singularity, so we have a stack of K D6 brains, so uh, 96 brains, so we're going to have these 96 brains. Now, if you have the NS5, uh, we need to um, take care of charge uh, conservation, and on the NS5, that tells you that um, the number of D6 brains ending on the left and on the right of the NS5 brain need to be the same. However, once you now introduce the eight brains, you're going to change the value of the cosmological constant. That means in the interior, we have the value of the cosmological constant to be zero. Once I pass uh, a D8 brain, I'm going to increase the cosmological constants by one unit, telling now that on this NS5 brain here, the difference in D6 brains ending on the left and right needs to be compensated by the number of D8 brains. Right? So we see there's one D8 brain on the, on the right. So cosmological constant is one. So there's a difference by one. So it reduces by one. And then you can essentially repeat the same story. Here's again uh, one, so reduce it by seven uh, to seven. And then here we have three, so we're gonna go to four and so forth. So following this recipe, we're gonna come up with this quiver. Right. And the reason I'm telling you this is because it's gonna be uh, important for the, the later part. Now, what the, we're gonna do with this bonding conditions is we can construct some interesting theories. Um, so, for instance, we start with a very simple setup. We're going to have three M5 brains on a Z2 singularity. If I have trivial boundary conditions, you just got to get the standard SU2 quiver with uh, two flavors on each side. Now I can lift off this uh, D6 segment here. So, I'm going to have uh, boundary conditions two here. And now the S rule tells you that the, these two D6 brains here, they cannot both end on the same end side because you only have one D8 brain on the other side. Right, so that means that one D6 needs to end on this under side, and the other one needs to end on the next under side. Then taking care of uh, or going to the, to the standard uh, brain configuration to read up this quiver um, by uh, using the, the brain annihilation, you see that you can essentially write the, the corresponding theory as SU1, SU2 with three flavors. Now you might say, um, okay, why, why do you write an SU1? Because SU1 is uh, sort of a, a not very interesting group. Um, so you could say that uh, at low energies, this looks like SU2 with four flavors. Actually, the, the point uh, why we, we, that we, we do still have uh, two intervals between uh, three and five brains. That means we, we still have uh, two tensor multiples, and uh, they're going to be important for the phase structure of this theory. Because now what we can do is we can ask what are the different uh, Higgs branches we can associate to this theory. And the Higgs branch phases are, are realized in the brain system by transitioning the brain system from the electric phase, in which the D6 brains are suspended between the NS5 brains, to the Higgs branch phase, in which the D6 brains are suspended between the D8 brains. Right? So essentially, I just uh, lift up these um, NS5 brains. And now, as I already um, alluded in the, in the introduction, the, the, the way I arrange these NS5 brains gives you the different phases this theory can be in. Right? And I'm going to label these phases by, uh, again, some different partitions. So I'm going to say 1, 3, or 1 cube, is the phase where all of these NS5 brains are separated along the x6 direction. And then, of course, you can, uh, you can have the other phases, but let's continue with this phase. So now, uh, just to recall how to read the magnetic quiver, um, you just read the Higgs branch uh, directions. So this you have 2 here, to give you this U2. You have one here, gives you one here, and each NS5 contributes a U1. 
And then we get this like an equivalent, and we, we know already this is just a finally written a fine default thinker diagram, so it gives you the minimal of default. Which is the same, which is the same modular space as SU2 with four flavors, which is which is fairly fine because this is the finite coupling uh, low energy description x one. Now I can go to a singular point of the tensor branch, meaning I'm gonna align two NS5 planes at x6 direction. So I'm just gonna align them at x6, not in the uh, 7, 8, 9 direction. If I do this, I'm gonna modify the magnetic group simply to this. So I collapse this bouquet to a U2 with a joint. And you compute um, the, the corresponding quantum and you find it's the it's another nearpotent orbit, but uh, it's now the nearpotent orbit of SO7, right? And already at this stage, uh, we, we see there's a clear difference to SU2 with four flavors. Because for SU2 with four flavors on a, on a, with a single tensor multiple, this is already the infinite coupling or the, the, the origin of the tensor branch. Whereas here, it's just an intermediate uh, singular point. And then the last phase in which we are really going to the origin of the tensor branch is where all the NS5 planes are aligned along X6. So the, the magnetic quiver is changed to uh, a three within a joint. And then you can uh, convince yourself that this gives you the subregular of G2, right? So having the presence of two tensor multiples already tells you there's a different um, structure of uh, Higgs branch phases. Although the low energy effective description is the same as uh, SU2 with four flavors. Now, why am I telling you this? Because this is one of the um, typical uh, phenomena in, in the 60 magnetic quiver business. We basically had theories which are defined on a minus two curve. If we go to infinite coupling, we shrink this minus two curve to, to zero size. And then the corresponding effect has been called discrete gauging in, in a work in 2018. And then we know essentially what this uh, discrete gauging means. It's just a, a, a discrete um, hyperkähler quotient. And this discrete hyperkähler quotient in this case is very, very nice because we have been looking at uh, Higgs branches which are describing well-studied mathematical spaces. So this is an orbits. For an orbits, these discrete uh, hyperkähler quotients are known. And so it's basically a confirmation of uh, this discrete gauging proposal, right? That, that is sort of the point to take away. But of course, the, the, the proposal holds for more general space. Uh, I'm seeing people turning on their videos. Does it mean there are questions? Uh, yeah, can I ask something here? Um, sure. So in this discrete gauging proposal, for example, in one case, you go from a theory with two U1 lags on the quiver to a theory yes. with two lag with a, with a adjoint loop. Yes. So discrete gauging, you normally think of as this projects out uh, states which are not invariant under the discrete symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but that's not, I mean, you expect that there's a lot more states in the U2 theory with an adjoint than there is in a theory with just two U1s, right? I mean, naively, you have the, um, you know, the other states in the adjoint of the U2, which are additional to yes. the, the two U1s. <laughs> So uh, I was wondering if you could sort of maybe explain why this is called discrete gauging, because it doesn't look like a sort of classical field theory discrete gauging, at least as I think of it. All right. So, okay. So in terms of the electric uh, frame of the, 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 the 60 theory, so what you have is you have a, a bunch of uh, NS5 frames and sort of they're interchangeable, right? So as, uh, as long as you keep them separate, um, you, you can permute them. But then if you, if you choose to um, put them together, on top of each other, you, you basically put them onto the, the fixed point of the of a permutation symmetry. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the electric side, this corresponds to what's called discrete gauging because you're in principle gauging this SN. Yes. On, th on the magnetic quiver side, it is a, it's a quotient. Mm -hmm. But you get a lot right? more states, right? It's like it's like saying when you when you put two brains on top of each other. You can yes. consider that as like a, a, a discrete gauging in the sense that you can no longer distinguish the brains. But in terms of the sort of states of the field theory, you now get a whole bunch of new light degrees of freedom. So in terms of the field theory on the brains, it's not mm -hmm. a discrete gauging, right? Yeah, yeah, that would be true. That would be true. Okay, okay. So, so, so here, I have just one mm -hmm. comment. Here, you should really add adjoints also for the U1s, which come from the NS5 brains. Yeah, that you can do. So then if you compare the Higgs branches, they are actually both. So both the Coulomb branch and the Higgs branch are then quotients. It's not that the dimensions grow here. Right? Because for the, for the Coulomb branch, when, when this proposal came out, I mean, 
the the adjoint is sort of not, not interesting. But it is true. If you want to have the correct matching of Higgs branch dimension, you do need to add it. Mm, I see. I see. Higgs Wait, branch and Coulomb mm -hmm. branch dimension? Yeah, I mean, photomagnetic equivalent. I mean, here, okay. so if you take this virtually, um, you just compute a Coulomb branch. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the of the Coulomb branch, it is, um, it is not very difficult to see that uh, this gives rise to the same thing mm -hmm. up to uh, an SN quotient. Right. Right, but for the hex bunch, of course, uh, it, it is true. I mean, you, you do need to take into account. This. <coughs> okay, I see. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, let, let me give you a challenge. Right? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All of the states that uh, we observe on the Higgs bunch are uh, consistent with the district bridge. Oh, okay, but that sort of sort of the essence of my question, right? Which is that what about the states which are not the states on the Higgs branch? As a field theory statement, discrete gauging doesn't just tell you about the Higgs branch, it's it's about the full theory. Yes, so uh, if you could find such a state where the discrete uh, uh, group is not that, it would be nice. All, all of this, is, you see, we are only sensitive to BPS uh, quantities. Mm -hmm. In the BPS sector, there is this big bridge. It could, it could be that the Z2 does not act, uh, but the action is trivial, right? Mm -hmm. It's still uh, this big gauge. So um, the uh, examples that uh, we see over here, uh, we, we know that the action is on the Higgs branch. Yes. I just don't know of um, states on the tensor branch or on other BPS states, uh, mixed branches, uh, right. non BPS. You see, we, we, we have to test on those, but except that we need some computational tools. Yes, yes. Right. So, but, but all we, what we know is consistent with this distribution. Okay, okay. Thank you. But, okay. So, so, not to further derail uh, this Marcus's talk, but one comment is that you could just take the magnetic quiver as a theory. And forget about any 60 relation. And then here, definitely, you need to add in, in the top quiver, you need to add three free hypers. And then you see that actually, when you relate the theories, then you are quotienting both the Coulomb and the Higgs branch kind of at the same time. So mm -hmm. the symmetry that you're gauging, it's true that it's not completely obvious where it is, but the, this does seem to fit. But yeah, anyway. I see, I see. But after adding the free hypers in the theory. Yeah, you need, definitely need to add the free hypers. Okay. The, Otherwise, I mean, the Higgs branch dimension would jump. That's yeah, clearly, it, that's clearly that, not sensible. Yeah. That, that that was the the computation. Uh, yeah, 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 and I think that's a bit confusing. It's like, so if you add the free hypers, everything is perfect. I see. Okay. Okay. Sure. Sorry, <laughs> Marcus. You know, no worries. No worries. No worries. I mean, it's better to have questions than me just going on for an hour. Very good. <clears throat> so let's see. Right. Right, so that was, I think, the slide I uh, was, and now, right. So I think I haven't talked about Hasso diagrams uh, so far. Um, there's also um, a, a thing called a Hasso diagram, um, which comes in it, which comes, let, let's say, let comes with a with a hex branch, or we can comes with a magnetic quiver. And um, so for each of these hex branches, for each of these distinct hex branches. We do have a distinct Hasso diagram, and the Hasso diagram gives you sort of more geometric information about um, the geometric space you're looking at. And again, uh, for the examples I, I've shown you, um, we are very lucky because mathematicians already worked out what are these these Hasso diagrams. So we see these Hasso diagrams are sort of are decorated by uh, by points with um, with lines in between, and these lines are what's called minimal transitions. And then these lowercase things gives you um, minimally perturbed orbits. Uh, of the corresponding algebra, this gives you an, uh, an AD, uh, an A type singularity, and this gives you some non normal slice. And uh, now, the, the point um, I want to make here is that you can also um, understand these um, Hasso diagrams simply from the, from the brain picture. And um, that is precisely just a point I want to emphasize. So, let me go, just go through this. Um, so, here I basically do the same brain picture of the phase one cube. But now I added these funny green lines, and these funny green lines are supposed to tell you that I'm now fixing the um, the, the, the point on the tensor branch. So I'm, I'm keeping my minus five brains in in a fixed x six position, and I'm not going to move them anymore. But now what I do is uh, I'm going to move uh, Higgs branch directions. 
right? So here, what I want to do is I want to transition from a, a hex branch to an electric phase uh, in the minimal possible way. But, but here, the, the minimal possible way is actually I need to align all of it together because I have these non-trivial boundary conditions here, and then I need to obey the S rule. So in order to open up the minimal uh, electric degree of freedom, which would be the SU2 gauge algebra here, I really need to align everything. And that just gives you the, the default transition uh, straight away. If you then go to a different hex branch phase or to a different um, point on the tensor branch, which has a different hex branch, then I have the situation where two NS5 brains share the same position X6, right? And then I want to repeat the same uh, exercise. I want to sort of reduce minimal transitions. And, and the first minimal step I can do is I can now take these NS5 brains, which share the same, which share the same position along X6, and I can put them together so that I effectively diminish one Higgs branch direction because they now move as one object, which is indicated by this times two. And um, it has been recently argued by uh, Antoine, uh, uh, Julius, uh, Ami, and uh, Dengha that this sort of, um, kind of or the distance transition where you take two objects and put them together is essentially an A1 transition. And then once you have this, um, once you have this intermediate phase, now we again need to go to the next minimal transition. But then again, due to the non trivial wonder conditions, the next minimal transition is already again putting everything together. So aligning the NS5 brains and the DT6 brains. But you've seen already that having the six brains aligned on the, on the same position in X6 already gives me another transition which I have, which I didn't have before. And finally, if I go to the one where all of the NS5 brains are in the same uh, X6 point, um, I, I, can do the, I can do one more transition, right? So I can start with having three. I can put two of them together. It doesn't matter which two. I put two of them together, which gives us this A1 transition. And then I have another one. And the, the, the minimal transition, which comes now, is just I put them on top of the stack so that the, the three are now all together. So this is a one dimension transition. This is a one dimension transition. And then the last thing I can do is again putting everything together because of this one boundary conditions, which uh, sure, in terms of brains, it's difficult to see it's a G2, but um, it, it is, it is uh, visible that this is the transition we need to do. Right? So that, that was sort of the the point to, to show you that in the brain system, we clearly see the, the, these different steps in the house of I see a video turns on. Yes, I, I, I have Hello. one question. Uh, yes. Uh, can you tell me in these pictures which ones are actually the SCFTs? It's just the three bottom configurations, right? The SFT is this one. Uh, right, the, the, the NS5 brains are uh, on the same position of the along X6. So the tensor, uh, the the the, the, the ah. tensor modulus have vanishing back in this position. Maybe. Ah, okay. So so all all four on the right are the SCFTs. That's right. That's right. So here I'm just going along the Higgs branch of the SCFT, right? So this is the the, the maximum or generic point. All of the uh, modulus yeah. are free, and then here I sort of smush two together. So I lost already one uh, Higgs branch modulus. Mm -hmm. And then I lose another one. And then here I sort of lost all Higgs branch modular. Sort of at the Okay, end. okay, okay, oh, great. So so right. so so the point is that the theory at the very top right has a G2 flavor symmetry, and then you do a nil potent Higgsing of that G2 flavor symmetry, and this gives you all of the other subsequent theories on the right. Right. And this one you, you see is the genetic point on the tensor much because the uh the separation between the NS5s is uh, finite. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, great. This sort of some, very good. Yeah, thanks. Great. Very good. Uh, right, so now uh, after sorry, this... Question, yes. Marcus, on the previous slide. Can you also um, discuss horizontal... No, no, the one that you just were talking about. Can you also discuss horizontal transition, like uh, tensor branch transition? You, you mean going from here to there? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in principle, I can do, but it's not part of uh, the, the Higgs branch Hasselbalken. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, in terms of the the, the brains, I, I can draw you this face, but I'm, I'm not sure what, what do you mean by. Um, I, I can certainly do this motion on the brain system. Well, you could uh, you could study you know the uh, total moduli, the full moduli space of the six D mm -hmm. theory, and that would. Uh, include some mixed uh, Higgs uh, tensor branches. And I guess that's what I'm uh, but, asking. But that's what is drawn. The, the, most of the phases are mixed Higgs and tensor. 
So, so if you go on the bottom to the left is tensor and the going up is mm. mixed and everything else is mixed. Mm. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay, thanks. Sure. Very good. Right, now, so after having told you all this, um, we're going to go to um, the domain part, actually, which is now we, we're going to have M5 brains on a detailed singularity. And uh, many things now go in parallel, but there's going to be a few changes. So first thing, that the first picture looks very similar to what I drew before, but now the, the thing is we have a detailed singularity, so it has, uh, or there's a fact that now this M5 brain, once I go onto the singularity, can fractionate into two half M5 brains which in terms of the uh, brain system is the familiar feature that we have uh, half NS5 brains as soon as we deal with a no antifold. And we're dealing with a no antifold because the detailed singularity uh, dualizes into a stack of K D6 brains on top of an O6 minus, right? So this, this empty, uh, whenever there's nothing drawn in between the D6 plane, this is a, a minus uh, plane, and this one is a, a plus O6 plus plane and, and, and so forth. So now we have the half and the side brains. If they are away from the default, we need to have a mirror. So that's why um, I, I drew them away. As once we approach the orange default, they can merge into a full and the side brain, which are there. then I can split along the orange default. And then I have a half and the side brains stuck on the orange default. And the point is that the uh, orange default uh, changes character as soon as I traverse uh, and the side brains. So I go from minus to plus and then back to minus. So this gives you this uh, familiar pattern of alternating photosynthetic uh, gauge groups. And now e, there's one thing that you may already notice is here I have k full d6 brains and here I have uh, k minus four full d6 brains. Um, the, the reason is that the only foot itself carries a, a charge, which we need to take into account when we uh, determine charge conservation on the N5. And um, the O6 plus has charge plus two and the O6 minus has charge minus two. So that's why we have this job. And this is also going to be the, the source of all evil that is coming up in the next slice. Um, because now what we're going to do is we basically terminate or we end the semi-infinite uh, stack of the six brains again on the eight brains, uh, as we did before. And again, we can play the same game. We can have trivial bounding conditions or we have can, can have more general bounding conditions. And now the more general bounding conditions are given by um, detailed partitions. And again, I have two choices left and right. And the computation or the, the complication that now turns out is precisely this, um, or the charges of the default. And let me illustrate this a, by focusing just on the left partition. So if you take um, a brain configuration like this, so I get the left uh, partition um, tells me where the um, data brains are located and how many of them. And I call this partition lambda um, just for, for reasons. And then I, I, I look at the transpose partition Although it is not a deep detailed partition, it's a, it's a very useful tool. And then uh, what I need to do, once I know where the D8 brains are, I need to compute how many D6 brains are there. And this I do by the same logic as we did in the ATAP case. So I go and each uh, step, I go to the NS5 brain, I look how many brains are left and right, and what is the value of the cosmological constant set by the, the number of D8 brains. And then uh, you can find that the, um, the number of brains or the number of D6 brains for the even intervals, so for the ones with uh, uh, the O6 minus or interval plane, um, are just given by the sum of um, some of these parts of the property partition. So it's a fairly nice numbers. Um, all of them are non negative. All good. But the trouble comes if you go to the O plus plane, which are the odd ones. Um, so the SP nodes. And, and here you see it's not just the sum of parts of the partition, but actually there's a minus eight. And this minus eight is precisely due to the uh, or default charges. And then you, you see, if your, uh, if your first uh, part of the partition is not big enough, you do have negative or vanishing uh, ranks, right? And then, um, I mean, this has been observed for uh, quite some time, but then you might ask, okay, well, what is happening now? And uh, there was a very nice paper by um, Dr. Alessandro and uh, Tom, is it out here, sure. Uh, what, what they did is they precisely um, took this the transpose partition, and then they classified what are all the possible uh, cases that can come up, basically just determined by this uh, condition here. And then um, basically what they did, they combined this a naive curve, so the naive curve meaning you just compute the negative ranks. You combine that with the uh, proper 60 low energy description by the F3 data. 
And then they showed by just using this uh, negative ranks, you still can compute the anomaly polynomial correctly. But the point to appreciate is that once you have this funny um, uh, partitions where the, 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 the ranks can be negative, actually you're dealing with um, different meta content, which, which can, for instance, be spinner representations. So, so that's why this is actually quite interesting. And later it has been shown that even if you have a, a, a fewer M5 bins, so that means in the boundary conditions are overlapping, you, you can still sort of uh, figure out what's happening. So long story short is what we call negative brains, they're not completely useless. Uh, they're actually quite nice because now we have a brain system and we have a brain system for theories which have like uh, uh, spin and matter or which have exception case groups. And that's why we wanted to use them to study the Higgs branches via magnetic groups. And that's what we're gonna do now after this example. So the example is just to illustrate what's happening. So we have a trivial bonding condition on the right. We have a non-trivial bonding condition on the left. Um, and naively, if you, if you just follow the algorithm, you get something like this. You get um, the, the 12 D8 points here. You get um, a perfectly fine number of D6 points here. But then you get sort of negative minus one. So you would write something like this. But the actual uh, corresponding description, F3 description, is now an SP2, fine. And SO12, also fine. But now it's actually defined under minus three, which tells you that this red guy here is um, a bispinner in SO1201. Right. So, so everything what which is in red is now uh, a spinner, uh, a hypermultiplet in the spinner representation. That's right. In terms of F theory, it's, it's not very su surprising, but uh, in terms of brains, it's it's quite nice that we can now use this brain system to to play around with these kind of theories. A uh, question: uh, How do you argue that uh, O one is uh, a flavor symmetry and not a gauge symmetry? Um, I would just say we have one spinner, and then it's an O one. I mean, did this over just tells me how many uh, spinners I, I have there. This no, over I'm, I'm, this, my question is, yes. uh, why is it a flavor symmetry rather than a gauge symmetry? Um, why would it be a gauge symmetry? That, that part I, I don't get. Because this, I mean, are you associating this one with the red one here? Uh, no, I'm just thinking of the naive quiver above where you naively you had the SP minus one uh, uh, gauge mm. group. Uh, now I mm. can accept that the SP negative is all positive. Uh, you mm. know, there are all sorts of uh, representation theoretic reasons why you would uh -huh. accept that. But then I would, uh, yeah, I don't know. Naively, I would expect a gauge symmetry. So okay. um, that's why I'm asking. Right. I mean, so in, in terms of what's happening, so na naively, um, so naively, you would expect um, you have an alternating chain of minus one, minus four, minus one curves, right? If you, if you have no 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 funny boundary conditions, but but now the this funny boundary conditions, which we don't really understand in, in terms of brains, but now tells you that this minus one curve actually is already uh, shrunken to zero. So I, I'm not sure how to um, how I would argue for for a gauge group. What, what I, I indeed know is that the, the SO12 on a minus three has a, a number of fundamental flavors and has uh, one um, hypermultiplet in the spinner representation. And that, that's why I, I denote this as a flavor node. Right, so anomaly cancellation tells you this is, uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't know another reason to argue it's not a gauge node, but um, that, that, that's sort of the point. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Okay. Now maybe it's time to go to an interesting uh, example. And uh, so, right. So the interesting example is we we go to something very very minimal, meaning we take uh, just two M five brains. We take the, the the lowest or the smallest singularity that we can look at, and we just vary one boundary condition, and the other one is trivial. Right. So one to the eight is just the eight here, and then three square is the two here, and then one square is the two here. Following the, the recipe, you get um, 0, d6, 3, d6, and minus 2, d6. In terms of uh, what is the, the actual description, it is an SU3, a pure SU3 and a minus 3, an empty minus 1 curve, and then we just have some O10 here. And the O10 is essentially just necessary in order to uh, make the SP0 formally anomaly free, right? just taking SP0 with uh, uh, eight levels. Now, we, we know that this theory does not have a Higgs branch uh, as long as both gauge couplings are finite or as long as both curves are finite. 
right? So that there's no Higgs bond. Um, now we do know there are, uh, we well, we can uh, open up Higgs bond um, moduli once we start um, doing things to the theory. And in particular, we want to look at the Higgs point of infinite coupling, meaning we need to shrink the um, the curves or we need to take the gauge coupling to infinity. So the first one that we can do is we can shrink the minus one curve to zero size. So we take the gauge coupling of TSP zero to zero. So what happens then is we get, um, in terms of the of the theory, we get a, a theory which is defined on the minus two curve, which would be an SU3. And we know the brain system now has two phases. Either the NS5 brains are separated along X6 or they are coincident in X6 direction. And all the other brains I just put into the Higgs bunch phase. Now, uh, we would like to know what is the Higgs bunch of this configuration, right? So, and we do have an expectation. So the expectation starts from looking at the theory in more detail. So we know we have an empty minus one, which we know gives us a small eight asymptote. So we expect there's gonna be uh, the minimum omnipotent over the V8 as soon as we take the minus one curve to, to zero sides. Now we still have the SU3 and the SU3 is gauged inside the eight. So we expect as global summity the, the commutant of SU3 inside the eight, which would be an E6 algebra. Now the expectation, or well, the expectation would now be that the Higgs bunch phase where the NS5 brains are still separated. So we're just taking the minus one to zero size, but still the NS5s are separated. It's just given by the SU3 hyperkähler quotient of the minimum you put in the V8. Right? So this, this proposal you, you can make and you can start computing, you can com compute the service series, and then you get something which clearly shows you there's an uh, E6 flow symmetry. But you also saw, uh, but you also see it's not only for the it simply because there's this uh, second joint here. But we know uh, it has dimension 21. And as it so happens, there is a 21 dimension on the of P6, which we know the, the here is um, because of the work of uh, Rudolf and Amiha. And uh, this one we, we do know. So now we can sort of use a different, we, we can use the second step because we know the, the other phase, the phase two, is realized by what we call discrete gauging, meaning we take uh, another S2 hyperkähler quotient. And then we, we can do a, a simple check whether this uh, makes any sense. We can take the ratio of these Hilbert series and see it's two. So that would be the expectation that the, um, the SU3 hyperkähler quotient is simply a Z2 cover of the E6 orbit of dimension 21. Right, so the expectation is now Hex bunch one square is just the SU3 hyperkähler quotient, which has global uh, symmetry E6, but it's not a hyperkähler quotient. Uh, it's not a, a E6 independent orbit, but it's Z2 coupled. And then the, the Higgs bunch of infinite coupling is argued to be actually the independent orbit of E6 of dimension 21. Now we can check this, or we can we can confirm this very, uh, this expectation by using the magnetic curve. Right. So we we read what, up the magnetic curve. Yes. Can, can you go back to the um, two slides? Um, I thought I saw some. I may. Uh, so, yeah. So. Uh, what are you looking for? The Z, there was a Z quotient. And before. Um, Ah, yeah, I see. So the global symmetry is E6 modeled out by Z2. Right, okay. That's for um, the, uh, the hyperkähler quotient. That's right, that's right. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a slice in the affirmative name. Okay, thank you. Um, just my confusion. Sure, thank you. Right, um, right. So we have this uh, expectation. Now we, um, Confronted with the prediction or with the prediction that we get from the magnetic curve, because we can just read out the magnetic curve from the brain system. And here in my notation, I labeled some nodes in red. Uh, red just means they're balanced, um, and everything else is good. So now we naively would read off that there is an SO10 um, times C1 proximity from the balanced nodes. If we compute now the, the monopole formula for these uh, uh, magnetic curves, we, we do indeed find agreement that the molecular formula for this magnetic river coincides with the SU3 hyperkähler quotient of the minimum of E8. And then, of course, this one we, we then already know because we know that these two Coulomb branches are related by an S2 hyperkähler quotient. 
So we also know that the Coulomb branch of this magnetic rubber now really coincides with the um, with the E6 uh, new patent orbit of dimension 21, right? And uh, so the, the point to 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 be happy about is now, first of all, that we have a very nice um, realization of this uh, hex branch. So the, this hex branch, although we we know it's an E6 velocity, now we also know it is uh, a new patent orbit, and we know which new patent orbit is, and we do have a new uh realization of this very high dimension new patent orbit of E6. Right. So that's that's sort of part of the excitement. The the second part of the excitement comes from the fact that the magnetic river is not the end of the story, but actually the beginning, because now we can we can do all sorts of other things. So we can look at the Higgs branch Hassel diagram. Before you get yes. there, I can ask a question. Sure. Um, so in the um, Hilbert series uh, for the Higgs branch uh, of the cover, is it possible to see uh, the Z2 symmetry that you're going to gauge? Or, Here, yeah. How, yeah. How does the Z2 arise? Um, in this one, I wouldn't know. We we do have, um, we we do have the highest rate generating function due to some other means, which I I, I didn't include today. And uh, what, since we have the highest rate generating function for for this uh, space, we we do. We, we can do the, the Z2 in, in terms of the highest generating function, and then you, you reproduce the, the, the E6 uh, open door. Okay. In terms of the yeah. of the unrefined Hilbert series, I wouldn't know. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Marcus. I, ha I also have a question sure. on the OSP quiver. So, so I just wonder what's the difference between O and, and spin group? So, so here I'm just computing with SO. Uh, with SO, not O. Yeah. So you wrote, wrote O for O2 here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree. Oh, I, I, I may not have. Uh, uh, right. Yes. right. Uh, OK. So yeah, OK. Very good point. Um, I have alternated notations um, back and forth. Um, so here, when, whenever I write O, uh, I mean SO. Um, so I, I, all the, the, the weight size, all, all the dressing factor size. All. Right. But does that answer the, the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So the global structure of the group doesn't matter. It does matter for sure. What happened? Oh, oh, I don't sorry. know. I got, I got kicked out. Uh, let me, sorry, I go back. Here we go. So, Ian, you, you can see. Ian, it, it does matter. It's it should, should matter, right? So. The, yeah. the magnetic uh, charges are different. Yeah. The magnetic lattice is different. Yes. Yeah, I just have a sloppy notation, if that's uh -huh. uh, what we're asking. So, O is always SO. Right, so that's, that's uh, the takeaway. Uh, right. Um, okay, so we can also look at the Hassel diagram, and again, we are in a in a very fortunate situation that we have a new planet orbit. So somebody already worked out what it should be, and now it's sort of the question: can we can we understand this from the brain system, or can we understand this from the theory that we're looking at? And uh, here we we can we can do the analysis of what's happening. Um, basically, we just need to uh, distribute. Um, Higgs branch degrees of freedom to various types of uh, happenings. So the first thing is we, we know that the, the theory at the beginning doesn't have any Higgs branch degrees of freedom, and we can open up uh, Higgs branch moduli by going to a singular point along the tensor branch, and then we would shrink the minus one, so we would get uh, the minus two. And we know this theory we, we know has now uh, global symmetry SO six, right? Um, but now you you can um, we, we know what is the global symmetry here. So the global symmetry here is E six. And you can compute what is the difference in uh, infinite coupling Higgs branch modular space dimensions. And you, you see uh, that the difference is going to be 11. So that tells you that this transition is 11 dimensional and has E6 uh, global symmetry. So that fits with the minimum of E6. And then the, the rest of the diagram is simply recovered by looking what is the infinite coupling uh, Higgs branch Hassel diagram of this guy. So we know the final coupling one is just an A5D4. 
and we know what happens at the infinite coupling. It's just uh, the D4 becomes B3A1 because that's one of the examples I uh, had in the first part of the talk, right? So we, we, we sort of understand where, where this comes from very nicely. This is sort of happening on the minus two curve at infinite coupling, and this coming from um, shrinking the minus one curve, right? So once we, we appreciate uh, this happening, we can then generalize this in various directions. On, on the one hand side, we, yes, can I, go ahead. Can I something on the previous slide? So sure. uh, the dotted line associated to the A1. Yes. Um, so how do I understand this? So, so, so if I understand correctly, the second to highest dot corresponds to the theory, which is actually the uh the theory living on the world volume of two m5 brains so it's a two comma zero theory um mm -hmm. then this a1 i guess is like higgsing the su2 inside of the r symmetry of that two comma zero theory is that right in right so in terms of so in terms of the near orbit mm -hmm. uh the difference between the dotted and solid line is um that this is what's called a, a special piece. Okay. Right. So um, there are some there are some neighborhood orbits which are special, meaning they are uh, images that they are in the image of the uh, Spartanstein map, and others are not special. But then um, the there's sort of a unique uh, larger orbit which is um, which contains its own special orbit, and that that's sort of what what this this means. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, what we have seen before, in terms of the brains, is that you have uh, because so so when I come from the top, what this a one means is that I have this this two ns fives which are aligned along x six but separated along seven eight nine, and now mm -hmm. I put them together. Um, okay, right, so, so, uh, so let me mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, so I, so so. Right. I, if I'm mm -hmm. thinking of moving up the diagram, then the last step basically corresponds to taking the two NS fives, and then there's a world volume theory, which is the two comma zero theory, and uh -huh, then I uh -huh. put it apart and I break it uh -huh. into sort of two. Yes, yes, yes. Components. Yeah, that that, that that's the way of thinking. It. Yes. Okay, I see. And uh, mm. okay, okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Sure. I'm running out of time. Let's see. Uh, let me finish this one. Um, right. So now we, we we can generalize this thing by keeping the minus one minimal and allowing other gauge groups to be living on the minus three. And then we want to ask what is the infinite coupling Higgs bunch Hasselbalch like for this object. And in order to determine, it's essentially we, we need three ingredients um, because they are we, we just need to understand where are the different Higgs moduli like coming from. So if G happens to be not SU3, so not the minimal uh, gauge algebra supported on a minus three curve, you, you can do standard partial Higgsing on, on that gauge group and you can uh, reduce it along. So that is basically on, on the right hand side. So it's the, one of the maximal groups supported on minus three is an SO12 with some fundamental or some vector and some spinner. And then you can partially Higgs it all the way down to SU3. Once, once you depleted all of your Higgs moduli that you can get from the minus three, uh, you can shrink the minus one, and then you have uh, a G gauge theory living on a minus two curve. But then again, you can have Higgs moduli that can come from the minus two curve, right? And that is essentially sort of the same diagram here, but now you can, on the minus two curve, you can Higgs all the way down to nothing. But again, remember, this is the finite coupling Higgs cycle, uh, the Higgs bunch as a diagram. And so, right. And the, the last step that we need is we also have Higgs moduli that can come from collapsing the minus one curve to, to zero size and then reducing it to minus two. And for this, we already have seen a proposal how this works. Um, so the proposal is that the shrinking of the minus one gives you a transition, which is the minimally the minimum product orbit of H, where H is the commutant of G in 38, right? So we have seen the first row. We have seen the SU3 case, and we have seen that the uh, difference in dimension of the Higgs bunch at infinite coupling is 11. We know that the commutant is uh, an E6 algebra, and this led to the uh, conclusion that there's the minimum equivalent orbit of E6. And now you can um, repeat the story for all the other cases that there are, and you, you find that the dimension of the global symmetry always uh, are co consistent with the choice of the minimum equivalent orbit of the corresponding commutant. 
So once we are happy with this, we can now combine the three different ingredients and um, propose the Hassel diagram, infant, infant coupling Hilsman Hassel diagram for the theory on a minus three minus one curve, which is essentially um, this uh, object here. I, I know it's a little bit small, but, but the point you should take away is that this line here is uh, everything happening just by hexing on a minus three. This line here is everything happening on the minus two curve with a modification for infinite coupling at the top. And then in between, we have the transitions of the minus one curve shrinking to zero size. Right, so that's sort of the, the generalization of uh, what we have seen before, because the, the SG3, SP1, uh, SP0 is just this one, SP6, A5, B3, A1. Right, so that's the, the first generalization that we can do. The other generalization is just we, we're taking a larger theory, uh, meaning we take more M5 brains and we take the same binding conditions on both sides, such that we have the MT minus one and now on the left and the right hand side in SU3. From the intuitions that we have gained before, um, we know that the once we, we shrink this minus one curve to zero, we have three different hex branch phases, which are again labeled by partitions. And then um, we, we can give a conjecture for what the corresponding hex branches are. And as we have seen before, the, the one where the NS5 brains are separated is very much likely to be a hypercalic quotient, but now it's a hypercalic quotient of the minimum of the eight by SU3 times SU3. So the global summary is going to be an SU3 times SU3. And you can verify this with a corresponding magnetic curve, and you find that indeed this magnetic curve uh, agrees or has a uh, monopole formula which agrees with the Hilbert series for this hypercalic quotient. Right? But again, remember that this hypercalic quotient is not the uh, Higgs branch at the conformal fixed point. Because the Higgs branch at the conformal fixed point corresponds to this magnetic quotient, and that is the one that has an additional uh, finite uh, S3 hypercalic quotient. Right? So this was hypercalic quotient, this is not a hypercalic quotient. Oh, well, this is uh, SU3, SU3, S3 hypercalic quotient, if you want. Right? But uh, this is not a new part of anymore, so this is just um, a hypercalic quotient. Right, now I'm sort of at the boundary of my one hour, um, depending on the... It would, would be nice to see F4. <laughs> <laughs> okay, F4 is also shorter, uh, I hope. Um, okay, let me let me do F4 in, in um, some short detail. Um, F4 in okay. four minutes. Oof, uh, Just go that, that, is push, that is pushing it. Uh, okay, but anyhow. Um, Right, so for the F4, um, what we're going to do is we still try to keep it simple. So the only thing that we do is we're going to uh, have more than five points and we're going to change bounding conditions a little bit. So right hand side is still trivial, left hand side is maximal. And then you see there's a bunch of red segments. And the corresponding uh, 60 theory is now um, given by this. So there's an empty minus two, and there's a, a, a minus two, but an SP1, uh, FG2, and there's an empty minus one. And again, we see that uh, at finite coupling, there's no Higgs branch. Right? It's just a point. And the same story as before, we can open up uh, an entropy Higgs branch moduli by uh, doing things, for instance, shrinking a minus one curve. And what do we expect for the global summary? Well, the name is already F4 because the um, commutant of G2 inside E8 is F4. So now, um, playing the same game as before, we shrink the minus one curve. So we get a brain system that now uh, looks like this. So we have four pairs of half and a sides away from the input. So we're going to have four different Higgs bunch, four different Higgs bunches which are related by discrete teaching. And I'm just going to be looking at the one at the conformal fixed point or the origin of the tensor bunch, which is going to be this one. And again, O is uh, SO, uh, sorry for that. And red is now the, the balance node. So if you look at a set of balance nodes, it's going to be an SO9 uh, algebra, which is very nice because SO9 is a maximal uh, subalgebra of F4. If you start now computing the uh, monopole formula for this object and you compare it to the exact Hilbert series for the F4, A3, independent orbit of F4, you find they agree. Right? So from, from this um, Higgs bunch, or from this, uh, from this 60 theory, we at the beginning knew that the global summary expected is going to be at four, but actually now we uh, confirmed that the uh, Higgs branch at the origin of the tense branch is an F4 dependent orbit, and actually not not some some low lying dependent orbit, quite a high dimension F4 orbit. 
And then we can play the same game. You can ask, uh, what about the hazard icon? Because the, the hazard icon is again known by mathematicians. And we can ask, can we uh, reconstruct this entire thing? And now um, the, the story goes very much an analogous to what actually before. Um, the diff we need to understand where the different Higgs multiple piece are coming from. And again, we're going to go sort of from the bottom to the top. So the, the first one is the, the, the vanishing minus one. We already know the logic. Um, it is a minus one. We know what is the commutant of the, of the gauge symmetry. So it's an F4. And counting dimension shows you it's uh, a minimal of F4. And then we're going to end up with, with a theory that looks like this. So for this theory, um, we know we can do a standard Higgs thing because there's an um, there's a standard phase of something. So this standard Higgs thing gives you a C3 transition. And then you're going to end up with something that just says unitary gauge groups. So this is a, then a theory that we can realize even in the brain system without our, our intervals. And we, we know uh, for this theory that the first sort of transition that we can do is just hexing this, uh, this full flavor here, and we get an A3 transition, right? So just by, by following these arguments, we already have taken care of the F4, the C3, and the A3. Now to take care of this uh, sort of more complicated piece, um, we need to remember that we're actually dealing with the hex function of infinite coupling. So we better take the, the, the remaining theory and look at the magnetic covalent infinite coupling. And now for this one, we, we use uh, sort of um, more indirect techniques. We use the we use course reflection and the insights from what, what we have seen before, having coincident and the brains and then uh, doing transitions here. So we start from the top, the one, two, four, and now the four, think about them as uh, four NSI brains, which are aligned along X6, but not in, in the Higgs one directions. And now we just uh, starting putting them together one after another. And following this procedure, uh, you, you can uh, trace out this, uh, this hazard icon in, in this way. Uh, maybe maybe I, I, I'm i not going to be uh, too detailed now since we're already over time. Um, if you want, we, we can talk about this after. Um, there's one, one, one thing that I just want to emphasize. You can look at a theory which is looking very, very similar, which sort of has the same uh, effective description up to uh, there's an empty curve missing. So the, uh, in the previous one, we had an empty uh, minus two here. We don't have it. So if you look at the magnetic quivers, they, they're going to be looking very, very similar. So the, the, the one with the phase one three is just the same as the phase one four as before. But the Higgs, the, the magnetic quiver for the uh, origin of the tensor bunch is now just this quiver, which is not going to be the new potent of F4. Right? So having a very, very similar looking uh, theory, but having a difference in tensor modifiers, uh, again, gives you the difference between being a independent orbit or not. So that's sort of similar to what we've seen before, where we had uh, boundary conditions that gave us uh, rise to a G2 at the, at the infinite coupling point. And uh, with this, I'm just slightly over time. Let me uh, summarize. So focus today uh, were 60 theories with uh, eight supercharges. And in particular, I was looking at detailed boundary conditions. And for them, it was known that they have um, the arrival of um, negative ranks or what we call negatively charged brains. And they are they are actually very, very nice, uh, as has been noted before. And now we, we use the spec because the, these configurations came uh, equipped with sort of a non standard matter content. So something that we, we haven't explored before. So we had a hyper multiples in a, a five spin representation. We had G2 gauge groups or something that was very interesting. Um, here, we, we haven't done sort of an exhaustive sweep. We haven't done a cataloging of uh, theories, but actually we've been focusing on theories which are interesting. Interesting here means theories for which we can actually say quite a lot. And quite a lot means um, theories which are understood mathematically very well. So these are near potent orbits. And, and uh, much to our surprise, we, we have found that some of these expansions are actually um, realizations of these high dimensional near potent orbits in particular of the F4 and the E6 one. But of course, there is a, a variety of open uh, questions. So um, what, what happens to the other Higgs branches? There are some uh, computational challenges with the, some of the magnetic curves that we encounter. So uh, I would say this is sort of an invitation to explore these non standard matter contents and uh, exception gauge groups uh, with the magnetic curves in some more detail. And with this, I um, would like to thank you for the attention. And if there's some more questions, please feel free to ask. All right, let's thank Markus.
questions. Uh, so I can maybe ask mm. a okay. So so I have a longer question and a shorter question. So maybe I'll ask oh, the shorter to. question first. <laughs> sure. So uh, SO twelve on a minus two curve. Yes. So uh, this is actually possibly two theories, right? So you basically yes. have two copies of the spinner matter, but whether you That's take right. spin spin or spin conjugate spin is is a priori different. Yeah. So you always drew it as the same point on the Hasse diagram when you drew the Hasse diagram for these things. Um, yes. Is there some way that you could see that difference? Not that I know. No. Actually, um, yeah. I mean, so so um, you know, to tell tell you the the, the full truth, if you look at something like uh, this. Mm -hmm. Uh, brain brain system is nice. You have this negative one, uh, but then um, yeah, the, the magnetic quiver uh, already hits some limits. Um, it's uh, has, for instance, some some bad nodes that you can't really compute the the, the monopole formula uh, with standard techniques. So mm -hmm. yeah, at the moment, no. Okay, I see. Right, so so that hits the limit. Also the same if you want to ask like very even partitions. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that sort of, there's the same. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the same. I see. Okay, thank you. Because in, in principle, um, so right, so that's a that's a general structure of these magnetic curves for um, uh, A and D type singularities with bound conditions. It's essentially you take um, some T rho theory. So mm -hmm. so the legs are basically given um, here. These legs are basically given by uh, some T rho of SO8, and this is another mm -hmm. T rho of SO8. And these uh, row left and right basically to translate to these partitions, and you just put them together. Mm -hmm. So if the, the partition is uh, sufficiently unfriendly, then at the moment the monopole formula doesn't, doesn't allow it. But it is, it's certainly a very interesting question how mm -hmm. much we can compute about these states. Right. Okay, yeah, with that I agree. <laughs> Sorry, right. can I interject? Uh, so, would you expect uh, that? So, for that magnetic quiver, which has, uh, 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 you know, it's a bad theory. Would you expect then maybe that there are two singular points on that Coulomb branch, one of which corresponds to the spinner, and the other corresponds to the conjugate spinner? Could be. I mean, I haven't much. I'm haven't just thinking, you that. know, by, by yeah. analogy with um, you know my paper with Benjamin as well. Yes, a few years ago. Yes, yes, it, it, it's certainly uh, a valid question. I, I don't have a very educated answer to this. Uh, it, it is, it is uh, one of the challenges that, that we do have. Is it uh, for Stefano? Is it the at all feasible to try to compute such a quiver in the way that you did it? I, I wouldn't dare. I mean, it's, uh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, that's what I okay. <laughs> yeah. Why do you call it the conjugate spin? No. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's not a complex conjugate. Fair enough. S and C. Let's uh, call it like that. Very good. Okay. I. Yeah, you could call it S and C. You could call it spin and another spin. But it's not conjugate. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Fair enough. No. S and C, yes. Okay, let's focus on Marcus. Yes. Well, actually, <laughs> to, 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 to correct uh, uh, your question, um, right. Um, so, so, right, I, I showed you the one where G is SU3, right? Uh, yes. Um, and then there's, there's another, um, you know, since, since we're all working on the same thing somehow, um, there's another issue. Um, so in terms of uh, brain systems, you know that when you have the orientifolds, um, there's sometimes a, a configuration where you can just change the position of uh, NS5 and, and a half D8 without actually creating or annihilating a physical um, D6 mm -hmm. right? So there's no distinguishable difference in terms of counting Higgs much more there. And right. that, that happens sort of all the time, right? So there, there's a bunch of transitions which you don't really see. So for instance, if you go from SO12 to SO11, the brain system looks the same as for the SO10. Ah. Right. Okay. So you can't really tell the, um, that there's no 
there's no difference in terms of mechanical quivers. Uh, same for SO10 to SO8. The SO9 brain system, you don't, you don't see this as two transitions in the brain system. It's just one combined transition. I see. Right, so, so I mean, this one, very nice. You, you can compute. I could. The G2, no, I don't see. I, I, can I can give you the SO7. That one we can compute. But the G2, again, um, just in terms of brain systems, you, you don't really see it simply because the... Um, uh, what what army calls the x x collab transition is it that, is it that one it's a special versus non-special that's right that's right i see so 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 the point is there is there isn't a magnetic quiver for three with the g2 next to a minus one curve it's just the so7 one for g2 there is uh, hmm? for g2 there is but for uh, other cases that it said um, you could yeah, make think... it, it's based on having special versus non-special object. So you could only right. work within the special block. I see. I see. I see. Interesting. Right. So 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 that's why it's sort of this uh, this game is sort of a balancing act between uh, something that you you can compute uh, yeah. and something that is interesting and. and, and yeah, here, here we, we found two things which are sort of very nice because mm -hmm. we know a lot about this space and we can say a lot about this space. But for others, um, I mean, some of the other things you can write down a mechanical problem, but then what else can you can you say, right? Right, right. Uh, well, then I guess I'll see you, uh... Okay, very nice. But do you, do you know this problem for nilpotent orbits that uh, you could construct column branches only for special orbits, but not for non special? Only for non-special orbits. So for only for special orbits, there exists a Coulomb branch structure. For non-special orbits, it is a generic problem. I see. I see. Okay. So so the the work of Carfer Pachesi say that uh, says that um, for every orbit of classical type, irrespective of whether it's special or not. There is a heat sponge question. Right. Right, right. For the D type, there is also non-special ones, and they give you um the quiver essentially. Yeah. So for all classical, they, they right. Be right. And uh, if you try to ask the uh, analogous question for Coulomb branch, then the answer seems to be that only for special orbits there is a Coulomb branch. For non special and mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. More questions for Marcus? I mean, I know that Craig has loads, but uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm waiting. Uh... Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi. Can you? I have a. Let just. Can you see me? Hi, Marcus. Yeah. Hi, hey, Marcus. Do you know how to generalize the rules to construct the magnetic quivers in the case of O6 and O8s, but no O and zero? So similar to what you've done in your uh, latest paper with uh, Zheng Dao, but without mm -hmm. just O6, O8. The, so, so how, how, how do you get rid of the ON? Sorry? How, how do you get rid of the ON? Well, there are config you're not forced to have the ON, right? In the configurations that uh, Ami considered 20 years ago. You can have it or not have it. You also have quivers. Uh -huh. Okay. Um I, I don't see I don't see what you what, what, what why are you saying? If you do SU and then alternating SO USB. But but the uh... You can have, so if you consider same charge of the O8 and O6, then you're forced to have the O and zero, if I remember correctly. But there are also four gauge and only three configurations of the form, say, O8 plus minus, O6 minus plus. The intersection of O6 and O8 gives O8. You, you, you cannot avoid it. Even if you, you have a Z2 action and another Z2 action. So the, the, the group together with Z2 cos Z2, 
it has three generators. Sorry, three elements which are non-trivial. One is the OC, the other is the OA, and the third one is the OA. I don't see how you can avoid it. I mean, there the needs to be a set to reflection, right? Then there's just a question of charge. But okay, maybe we can discuss this later. Um, do we have uh, questions specific to the talk? More questions. All right, so I'd, I'd say let's thank Marcus uh, one final time. And I'll stop the recording. <laughs>